Welcome and thank you for joining us for this webinar presentation. We are the Cybersecurity and Information Systems Information Analysis Center, or CSIAC, one of three IAC domains in the DoD Information Analysis Centers operating under the Defense Technical Information Center, DTIC, within the Office of the Undersecretary of Defense for Research and Engineering. Our informative webinar series highlights current and emerging research and technology developments. It presents an opportunity for accelerating the DOD's leverage of these advancements by increasing awareness and fostering technical collaboration. CSIAC serves as one of the premier information research partners and curators of technology advancements and trends for the cybersecurity and information systems community. As such, our organization supports those working in the cybersecurity and information systems domain of DOD research and engineering. We do so by helping navigate the vast landscape of scientific and technical information, allowing our customers to get a head start on their technical projects. With an understanding of the cybersecurity and information systems DOD research and engineering landscape, we provide research and analysis services. We help unlock access to information, knowledge, and best practices from government, industry, and academia to stimulate innovation, foster collaboration, and eliminate redundancy. We hope you enjoyed this webinar presentation and that it serves as a catalyst for community collaboration and improved DoD cybersecurity and information systems research. Good day, everyone. Thank you for joining this webinar presentation. My name is Philip Payne. I am the technical lead for the Cybersecurity and Information Systems Information Analysis Center, or CSI. Before we get started today, I would like to note a couple of administrative items. First, if you are dialed in my phone and would like a copy of the slides, they were posted to the CSI webinar announcement. You can go to csiac.org forward slash webinars and find today's webinar. When you click on it at the bottom of the announcement, it will say download presentation. Uh, second, all participants are muted, but feel free to chat using the attendee chat window on the lower right-hand side of the webinar screen. You can chat with each other, and I'll be monitoring that chat as well. However, if you'd like to pose a question for the Q&A session at the end, uh, please use the please click the ellipse icon with three dots labeled more slash panel options to bring up the Q&A window as part of your layout. At the end of the presentation, I'll go over the Q&A. Uh, for the benefit of those dialed in on the phone, I'll read the question out loud to the presenter. If you have any technical issues during the presentation, have no fear. The full presentation will be available online. Uh, please check back to the CSI website. Once the webinar is posted, the GoToWebinar button will take you to the recording, which will be posted at the CSI YouTube page. That being said, I'll introduce today's presenter. Uh, Mr. Lynn Wallace is a systems and software engineer in the 309th Software Engineering Group at Hill Air Force Base advising the Air Force Sentinel Program in Software Assurance. After working as a programmer for 25 years in defense, medical simulation, and video games, he spent much of the last 10 years studying cybersecurity and software assurance, receiving his CSSLP certificate in 2020. The resulting discoveries have energized his work and research in support of Sentinel. Mr. Wallace? Good morning slash afternoon. Are you ready? Yep, we're good to go. Okay. So, hi, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon. So, last month, Karen Wetzel from NIST walked us through the National Initiative for Cybersecurity Education framework, and I thought it was nice. But looking into it, I see that I'm part of the cybersecurity workforce. I'm a software developer. What do I have to do with cybersecurity? Now you want me to take a month off to get certified? Do you realize what you're asking? Do you know how hard my job is? Have you ever written an enterprise app? Have you ever written real-time code for a medical device that could potentially kill someone? Has your software trained astronauts? Have, are you credited on 19 shipped video game titles? Do you even know what you're talking about? Well, that's where we're going today. <clears throat> and uh, let me make a note here real quick. Attend next year's Tony Awards. All right, 
Anyway, my name is Lynn Wallace, and, and as Philip told you, I work at Hill Air Force Base supporting the Sentinel program. As I like to say, come on, it's just a fleet of remotely launched thermonuclear missiles. What's the worst that can happen? There's nothing like working on a weapon system that with it, which has a cost of an error or misuse uh, that results in a body count ranging from four to nine digits to make one sit back and reassess best practices and identify the ones that may not be quite good enough for us. So, my objective today is to remove the distance between, help, help begin removing the distance between cybersecurity and software engineering. I use the same slide set for a webinar for DAU, Defense Acquisition University, a few months ago. It was towards a, aimed for a more general audience. Uh, this being CSI Act, most of us are gonna be sab cyber savvy. So I'm going to be trying to add some useful information for you as I talk about the slides. Now, if you came to cybersecurity like I did from a software hey, engineer. Just to, just to chime in, you're not sharing your slides just yet. Oh. Yeah. Then once you go too far down the road. Thank you. Totally forgot about that part. Yep, no problem. <laughs> Can you see them now? And let me try yep, to drag this out. Full screen. Perfect. Okay. Whoops. So my goal today is to try to help shrink the distance between cybersecurity and software engineering. If you came to cybersecurity as I did from software engineering, then you know 90%, maybe more of what I'm about to talk about. I might put it in a different way. Knowing me the way I do, I will probably make a provocative statement or two along the way. Um, I welcome any pushback, any discussion, either now or later. My email address is on the title slide. Happy to discuss this stuff. Um, if you are purely a cybersecurity professional, then I'm going to give you a lot of information that I think you need to know. I'm going to try to address the technical gap between cybersecurity and software development. I'm going to teach you about something about programmers and how software is created. Uh, that will help you work with us to make the life cycle more secure. And if you're a software person, hopefully I get you at least curious about security. So I'm going to spend a lot of time on the first two sections and on the final section, skim over the third and fourth sections, um, because there are some misconceptions, assumptions, I think, that, uh, that I want to cover. So let's get into it. Uncomfortable truths about software and the people who write it. <clears throat> There's the flow chart of every piece of software ever developed, every piece of software that will ever be developed. Software automates the processing of information. Now, when I say automate, I want you, as I do, to translate that automatically into software. And that a wheelbarrow automates the moving of dirt. We're talking about software. We're talking about automating the process of information. Now, since most, despite most of the software that I've written being real time, um, I could, you know, we could decide to relax the time constraints, expose the signals and some of the process levers to a person, and we could do that in in a much slower and do it all manually. So that's what I mean by so that's what I mean by automating manual processes. When I write that code, I'm putting down step-by-step -step instructions to do this and that. When I debug it, I'm loading it up into the debugger. I'm stepping through it step-by-step, -step, make sure it's working properly. We process information slash data. That information, of course, has value to someone. If it's not worth anything, then why would someone pay me or pay you to write software to automate its processing? Of course, sometimes value is subjective, uh, value is always subjective, and sometimes the value of the information to an attacker feels more than the value to the information holder. Software is, of course, it's insubstantial. It's nothing but carefully organized thinking. Uh, it's the most malleable thing that humans create. If I change a semicolon in The Great Gatsby, it's not going to change the meaning. But if I change a single character in a piece of software, I can fundamentally change the behavior of the software. 
And once it gets above a thousand lines or so, it starts becoming unmanageably complex. Now I said thousand lines. Measuring software by counting lines of code is, in my view, equivalent to measuring fine art by how many brush strokes were made. So here we have two pieces of work created by the same developer. One's a lot bigger than the other, but curiously, he took a lot longer to create the smaller one. There are some critical pieces of code at the tip of Mona Lisa's nose, the smile. Mona Lisa's smile is going to be a critical piece of work in that piece. On the Last Supper, the expression of the apostles' faces glaring at Judas are uh, going to be critical. But what's to say about the criticality of the rest of the brushstrokes that da Vinci put down? Measuring software by counting the lines of code is horrible. But unfortunately, because it's so difficult to measure software by other ways, it's the most useful measure we have. Keep that in mind when we are trying to meet an 80% unit test code coverage metric. Moving on to more about software. I remember 44 years and six months ago, day one of computer science 101, the professor First lesson was perfect code doesn't exist. Even hello world, in order to get those characters to the screen or printed on paper, as we were doing back then, you're writing a lot of software that you didn't write. There's too much software there to prove that it is correct. The takeaway from that that I want to, to put out is the only risk-free software is what you're not running. Automating information Processing with software involves taking on some level of risk. Lesson number two was keep it simple, stupid. stupid. Keep your attack surface small, keep the code size small, something you can manage. And I learned much, much later that that's actually one of the first principles that Salzer and Schroeder wrote down. We'll talk more about that. Software is never done. As long as it's running, someone is maintaining it. Everything that happens during acquisition of software, other than after the decision to, we're going to build this thing, also happens during sustainment or maintenance of the software. Yeah, we apply security patches, we fix bugs that people don't like, we change tiny things, we team, but we also implement capabilities during sustainment. So keep that in mind. Uh, the takeaway again is software is never done. And of course, you all know, being cybersecurity people, if you're try trying to protect an enterprise at some at, at some point, there's always software in some stage of its life cycle. Here's a key point and a key problem. Software is a zero barrier to entry in this industry. A browser with a text editor is a development environment, roughly equivalent, so in some ways even better than the development environment I used when I came out of school in 85. Literally anyone can write software that literally anyone else can use. If your software proves to be useful, then other people are going to want to use it. That's been the way we've done software for 50 plus years. As a result, relatively few know all the software that they're running. I hope in the DOD we're getting much better at that. But when you're talking about every opcode operand pair on every processor in your enterprise, it'd be nice to know what software is actually running. <clears throat> Take away a, a, a sidelight of that is uh, nobody more or less knows who wrote all of their software. Unless your programmers are writing code on bare metal all the way up to the user interface and the, the major functions, you don't know who wrote the software. You don't know if they're a friend or foe, but you also don't know how good they are. One thing you can probably, one thing you can presume until you have evidence otherwise they weren't thinking about security when they wrote that software. Now, this slide is full of stereotypes, so I need to disclaim it. It's more about Lynn and his experience, but keep it in mind as you go forward and talk to your software colleagues that I'm not describing any particular person here. Everyone has their own journey, and, and uh, we all have different levels of awareness of different things. But in general, in school, our undergrad teaches us how to write software that does things. Use a linked list to do this. Take this input, produce that output. We don't think about attributes 
the various quality attributes unless they happen to be a focus of the exercise. Sometimes your grade might get docked if your code is, if your code is crap, but it works. But if you meet the terms of the assignment, you pass and you graduate. Thinking back, again, 41, 44 years ago, I don't recall a single lesson in security. Now, granted, that was 1981 to 1985. Cybersecurity wasn't that big a deal. Wasn't that big a concern. But I quiz my new, my coworkers, most of them more recent grads than I am, some of them new grads, and I find that only a few schools in the across the nation require cybersecurity training as part of their undergrad in back in uh, computer science. So in school, we're not taught to think about security. And that's a very, very small step away from being taught not to think about security. We don't know about security until we do, obviously. A few years ago, I was talking to a colleague on my software assurance soapbox, emphasizing how I had come to realize that cybersecurity is fundamental to software development. I think I made that point on a previous slide. <clears throat> And she said, but we don't know security. That took me back for a while. But then I thought about it and I realized, you know what? I didn't know how to write the first program I ever wrote as a professional. I didn't know how to write the last program I wrote as a professional. I don't know how to write the next program I write until I figured it out. Our job as software developers is to take a problem, break it down, figure out the solution. Every new program is a novel problem. While we are creating our code, while we're sitting there typing away all day, we are making a dozen or more design decisions every day. And if we're not thinking about security, some of those design decisions are going to affect the security of the software, hence the security of the system that's, that's deployed upon. That's a huge problem. So a good programmer, it cares about quality. Um, I hate when I am under schedule pressure and I have to push out software that I haven't been able to test fully. I haven't been able to walk through it. I haven't been able to clean up little technical debt that I wrote into it. Um, that bugs me. I consider myself a good programmer. You know, the, the colleagues in the video game industry that I used to work with, they, they would probably tell you, then, uh, yeah, he's okay. Nothing spectacular. And I would agree. Uh, the software that I write is never brilliant. Sometimes it's clever, uh, but it tends to be clean, tends to be, tends to get the, you know, gets the job done, obviously. And I do have the ability to generate lots of code uh, in a relatively short amount of time. So, so that's my claims to being a decent programmer. I don't expect to ever win a programming contest, for example. So good programmers are curious, lifelong learners. We're always learning. Uh, aspect of the language that we haven't covered, we haven't exercised before. We always have to learn about the brand new problem, its requirements, learning about new security regimes, um, new languages that are coming out, new libraries avail available. And yeah, we tend to be a little arrogant. Um, when I do a file new and have a blank screen, and have been assigned a problem and create a solution out of nothing, just thinking and typing. That's very gratifying. But there's also this. Um, if you want your C141 to do Mach 3, give me a few minutes. I can make that happen. But have you thought about teleporting? Now, granted, I'm talking about simulation. And another note about simulation. If I'm creating a simulation or even a video game, I have to, I have to specify natural laws. They don't apply until I make them. Uh, so, who else specifies natural laws and make them apply? Makes them apply. Whether you not whether or not you thought about God, um, the point is, we are God inside of our little logical universes, and uh, that that builds our ego, doesn't it? <clears throat> Lazy ish. Let's talk about that for a minute or two here. Um, reuse of trusted components is a well-established best practice. Once we graduate, we realize that pretty quickly. The problem is for the last 50 years or most of the last 50 years, we've implicitly trusted software components. And therefore there's a lot of insecurity, a lot of defects in the supply chain. Um, 
modern software is created by piecing together components to a large extent with glue code. Our DevSecOps pipeline is software from the supply chain glued together into a workflow. But another aspect of being lazy ish is that when we need to learn something, we want the shortest, quickest lesson possible. And when we learn what we need to know, we're done. We try to remember where we learned it so we can recover that later or read more deeply if it becomes a, a, something that we want to do. If it takes me more than 10 minutes to answer a question about Python or C++ um, or the library that I'm using or the requirements, then it's become a chore. So programmers tend to work best, and there's some documentation behind this, from quick, quick hit, easy lessons about things they can use right away. So I'm going to try to help you find and nurture security champions in your software organization. And I've got a pop quiz coming up on subsequent slides. But before we get there, we need to assume that that programmer doesn't know about security, doesn't even know the first thing. So let's get some terms out of the way. A weakness, and I'm afraid, I'm sorry if you already know this by art, but a weakness is a defect in your software that lives in the baseline. Developmental operational test people may not consider it a significant defect, significant enough to even track the user, the operator, the customer, the user may not even consider it worth fixing, but it is a defect. An example would be executing a request to perform a system function from a user that you have not authenticated or authorized to do that. More on why we chose that particular one later. A vulnerability is a weakness that has been released into the real world and is, and is reachable or potentially reachable by someone who wants to make, misuse the system. And then an exploit is when an attacker figures out how to trigger that vulnerability, how to trigger the weakness. So here's my pop quiz. It starts off really stupid. Who was, who was buried in Grant's tomb, right? Um, if, if Lynn creates a vulnerability in Lynn's software, who did it? I did. Who should fix it? Lynn. Who else can fix it? Well, my colleagues. Maybe I've moved on. Uh, maybe it's been picked up by another shop, but the people who work on the software, they can fix that vulnerability. They can remove that weakness. Looking for a particular answer here. Cybersecurity professionals cannot fix the software. I know there are isolated cases where you can actually patch an executable to make it work without being vulnerable. But in general, all you can do is try to keep a bad user or a clumsy user away from the vulnerability so that it doesn't get triggered. This should teach the programmer that it's on you. <laughs> if you write the software, if you write a weakness that becomes a vulnerability, it's you that did it. You need to fix it. Finally, we're talking about ignorance, laziness, a little bit of honest oversight here. All of the other stuff is what keeps all of you busy in cybersecurity. Again, a slide should be titled more of what Lynn didn't know, as opposed to what programmers in general. This slide captures the principles that were written down by Salter and Schroeder, plus a few that we've come up with since. And I talked about KISS, economy of mechanism. Uh, open design is something that's drilled into us in school. Make your functions single purpose, make them reusable. If you write something down, if you write an algorithm down more than twice, make it a function. As I graduated and started writing software, I learned more of these principles along the way. <clears throat> These privilege, pretty easy. Uh, separation of duties, work factor, perfectly uh, intuitive, right? If you make the work of accessing the information more than the value that perceived by the attacker, that you've got enough security. In fact, um, that brings to mind a memory. I can't remember a single security lesson from my uh, undergraduate curriculum. But I did attend a drive-by lecture from one Grace Hopper in Omaha, and she posed the question rhetorically, how much security do you need? How valuable is your information? And that stuck with me. It caused me to, over the decades, 
do a Google or whatever existed at the time in terms of a search engine, how do I write secure software? The lessons graduated from don't crash. Okay, that's a no brainer. Uh, to least privilege, uh, try to trust your uh, separate duties, try to have fail safe defaults. Let's not ignore psychological acceptability. That is making your security controls not so hard that people start trying to find a workaround. Your pa you know, who writes down passwords? Let me put my hand in. Um, a frustrated programmer, well, a frustrated user in your network is, is dangerous, but a frustrated programmer is even more dangerous, especially if we haven't drunk the security Kool-Aid. Remember, we're outside the box problem solvers. If your cybersecurity control is a big enough problem for me, I'm gonna to try to find a solution around it. And the solution I find is probably not going to meet your security goals. Look at the left or the right edge of that, that display. I didn't know what complete mediation was until I studied for my certification. Granted, I did defensive programming. And if you combine that with defense in depth, you get close to complete mediation. But now it makes perfect sense. And it's something like, okay, I should be doing that. I will need to be doing that in the future. These common mechanism, another one that's fairly obscure, but perfectly understandable. Compromise recording usually takes a programmer aback when they hear about it the first time. Because when we are writing our code and debugging it, we want all the information we can get. We need to know where it failed and why it failed, what were the conditions. But it doesn't occur to us that if that screen dump, if that stack dump goes to an attacker, then they can hold that tech stack against their zero day exploit and say, oh, we can hit them here, we can hit them here. But once I know, now I know. All right, so we came from the same place, but we don't talk anymore. There's more than I wanted to say. But so here's a very brief history of cybersecurity. And let's just hit a couple points on the black hat side. We're living through a pandemic of malware and cyber attacks right now. It feels like it's about September of 2020. We don't have a solution. Everyone's taking their precautions, wearing masks, separating, staying home. Um, you guys are protecting the systems as much as possible, making things harder to do to make it harder for the attackers to take advantage of. But we're on that, we're on that uphill climb. And it, to my feeling, and I suspect most of you agree, it's not going to get better anytime soon. Um, Stuxnet was an amazing piece of work. I'd like to think that if I was hired to do that kind of work, that's what I would come up with uh, because I'm a, an employee of the DOD. I get lifetime identity protection thanks to the OPM data spill. I'll talk about Log4j in a little bit. Let's switch over to the white hat side. Skip over buffer overflow. In 1974, two cybersecurity professionals, let's see if I can find it, wrote this paper. Did you catch the lie I just told you? Let's think about 1974. The ARPANET connected 50 computers worldwide. They weren't cybersecurity professionals. They were computer scientists. And as people were building that thing that would become the internet by connecting more and more print, more and more computers together remotely, they started thinking about what happens when we start sharing data from computer to computer, from user to user. And they wrote down this paper that puts down in plain English some very fundamental principles. Like I said on that previous slide, I didn't know about this paper. I didn't see, I didn't hear about some of these principles until 2020, long after I stopped writing code for a living. I've seen that paper cited in every cybersecurity training I've ever taken, and I've seen it cited in zero software development or computer science trainings I've taken. We need to fix that. Um, other other highlights from the white hat side, um, ISC squared, uh, ISC squared, and SEI cert came out in, 20, in 1989. I remember that. That's when hacking became something that you would see in the news every now and then. Um, 
Bill Gates committed Microsoft to security about a decade late, in my opinion. You probably agree. Cybersecurity didn't become a thing that was done until 2014. And now we have a whole workforce. We have all the industry doing it. We'll talk about SBOM later. Um, of course, I need to update the slide, but uh, we've got the nice framework. Again, I'm completely a fan of it. But yeah, it's the same slide. If you look at the history of cybersecurity, you find the history of uh, computer science. So a little bit more stereotypical slide here, but not much. These are more recommendations. Programmers need to be taught, need to realize that security is fundamental to writing software. We need to take the attitude that security is our job before it's your job. We need to understand that information has inherent and imputed value. We need to know what valuable information we are processing. We need to know what's critical. We need to know what's especially sensitive so that as we make those design decisions all day, every day, <clears throat> we don't do something that makes that information easier to get to. For the longest time, and you're going to think I'm paranoid because I am, I was afraid to learn about hacking. I was afraid to research it because I knew I wanted probably to have a security clearance in the future. I thought that might be a red flag. I tested that with the mission defense team in our first meeting six years ago and said, is this, does this make sense? This doesn't make sense, does it? And yeah, they kind of rolled their eyes and said, how can you defend against something you have no idea about? So yeah, we software people need to be taught how to think about like attackers. Recommendations later. We need to learn how to write secure software, how to develop secure software, not just write secure code. More on that in a few slides. And once we do, we're going to learn how easy it is. There's no triple integration. There's no linear algebra, no probability statistics. Well, there's some statistics. Uh, no quaternions, no tensors, no thermodynamics. If you hand Salter and Schroeder's paper to a freshman, they're not going to know what it, what it means. But if you hand it to a fresh computer science graduate, they're going to read it. They're going to understand it. They may have a couple questions. This all makes sense. It's, it's common sense. And common sense is what you learn and it makes sense to you. It's not necessarily common, right? On the cybersecurity side, you guys, I'm, I'm trying to teach you how programmers think. <clears throat> uh, you need to interact with them more, maybe have questions, maybe start an argument. I don't know. Programmers love to argue in general, I think. Um, you need to understand how we work. I've taught you a little bit about that. But you need to understand the software development life cycle enough that you can help us secure it. Because we do need to secure it. Um, I mean, I'm going to emphasize the early phases more than the later. You need to help us create secure software. And finally, we need to really put continue putting attention at that interface between the system level where cybersecurity works and the software level where we work. We need to be able to translate the very blunt instruments that are, via, that are RMF controls into software shells. We need to be able to translate system shells regarding security into the software shells that drive our work. All right, now for the high speed section. Uh, I'm gonna try to bust through these slides fairly quickly. An air gap is the kind of network that I was working with when I graduated. We use sneaker net all the time. And here's uh, an uh, unmanned aircraft system of flow chart or data flow diagram. You see it's got active, you know, sensors, chips all over the place. Data flowing is the lines. Down there is removable RAM, which is where the mission would get loaded or where mission data collected would get downloaded. All of these chips have software running in them. Keep that in mind. You probably didn't write it. So it's a nice, compact, nice and controlled data flow. Here's the real data flow. Uh, at the depot, it has its own attack surface. Uh, chips are loaded. New program, new software updates are loaded into it. The supply, uh, the software factory, that's supposed to be the DevSecOps Infinity sign. Um, the supply factory has a significant attack surface. It may have been built by people who weren't thinking about software. 
um, and it leads into the 50 year old worldwide supply chain. Air operation centers, of course, have their large attack surface backed up by a 50 year old supply chain. I know you saw this cartoon before you saw it last month, um, but I kind of like this version a little better. In theory, it's possible that the KTB compromised a fundamental piece of software that's still running. Uh, they could, in theory, have it in their back pocket. I don't think that's actually the case. One thing that they're inside, of course, your, your uh, air gap doesn't protect against are, are these side channels. Those are fun to look into. Um, it's about getting information from a computer system without hooking a wire up to it. Um, I laughed out loud the last time I saw the Bourne Supremacy ultimatum and uh, Jason Bourne's looking through his spotting scope across the avenue in New York City into the window of the CIA officer's um, office and saying, what's Treadstone? Obviously, um, that's why we have skips, right? And uh, so your, your air gap, of course, can't protect against an insider threat, even a clumsy one, let alone a clever attacker, and that includes the whole supply chain. I'm going to go ahead and say it. As a programmer in your organization or your work or your software supply chain, I can defeat every cybersecurity control you put in place, depending on how on what they are. Um, We've seen it happen. We'll see it happen shortly. Now, before I start dissing on DevSecOps a little bit, let me let me make clear it's awesome. We definitely need to go there. If you're not there, keep working towards it. The DevSecOps process and the pipeline of tools, software, are going to help us create much more secure software, but it doesn't cover all of our bases. Going to try to bust through Log4j. I'm sure there's someone listening, maybe one person who hasn't heard about it, but uh, Log4j is a library that does logging for Java. Extremely popular. It's from the Apache Foundation, which does produces libraries of software that make programming easy. They standardize it. It's generally very good software. But in 2013, a programmer uh, at Apache, competent, community minded, implemented a feature from a user request that said, um, if, if I put special characters in my log message, I want you to execute the next request as a Java native directory interface function, basically a system function. A user who was unauthorized and unauthenticated allowed to execute a function on the system. So someone in 2021, November, I think it was, just before Thanksgiving or around the time, discovered that since in modern software, especially Java software, everything is logged to provide that diagnostic information to get programmers when something goes wrong or to provide forensic analysis for cybersecurity after an attack is discovered. But everything's logged, including the data that the user types into a web form. So now everyone who has access to your system, all these public websites out there, um, your, your Minecraft game, can type in a particular username or as their player name, those special characters, and they can execute their code from their server on your server. It's still extant, um, way too many. I don't know if it's a majority or just a large portion of the downloads of Log4j are still the broken versions. So that's an example of a programmer not thinking about security. There was no one in the room who said, wait a minute, you want to let an unauthenticated and unauthorized user execute code on the code of their choice on my system? There was no one in the room to do that. It was peer reviewed. It was scanned millions of times by the best tools available. I need to fix that pie chart. Uh, it's closer to half of the top 25 are not detectable or hard to detect in source code. Anyone who measures security will tell you that 70% of Lately exploited vulnerabilities are design flaws, not secure, not code flaws. They're hard to pick up in, in source code. Um, part of the reason for that is the tools keep getting better. And that leaves the early phase injection of vulnerabilities to be the ones that are still out there and being taken advantage of. 
as one of these uh, vulnerabilities becomes a problem, the tool vendors put their heads together and, and think, how can we detect it? So they can now detect heart bleed. Uh, presumably they can detect log 4 j I haven't tested it myself. Um, but moving on, here's, I know it's a night chart, but here's the CWE top 25 common weakness enumeration put out by MITRE. There are now 938, I checked yesterday. It's a community effort. The ones that I flagged in red, are the ones that are tend to be difficult or impossible to detect in source code. I would expect some pushback from this slide. Just because it's not in red doesn't mean that every tool is going to detect it every time. Just because it is in red doesn't mean that there are tools that can detect it sometime. Okay. But it's very hard to detect with tools decisions that were made while the software was being created. <clears throat> of course, if someone hacks your process like solar winds, that's going to be really hard to detect in your pipeline. And because we create DevSecOps pipelines or, you know, DevOps, which is what it was before DevSecOps, DevOps was come, came around to produce change, produce new software, new versions faster than the competitor. Because we're pushing it out faster, um, that pushes the potential vulnerability out faster. And it takes an eraser, partially at least, to some of the security boundaries between your development environment and your operational environment. Um, if I am able to push software to a weapon system in the field from my comfortable air conditioning cubicle, that's a problem. We need to make sure we've got our phasing, our, our, our staging set up right. Let's talk about SBOM for a little bit. There are yet to be discovered tribes in the New Guinea and Amazon jungles that are trying to make SBOM a thing. It's a whole of government. It's a worldwide thing. We're all trying to undo the lack of discipline in the software supply chain to expose where the software came from and who wrote it. So many details to work out. It seems a panacea in part on, its, uh, on the face of it, but I'm afraid it's gonna be five to 10 years before we start getting real benefit out of SBOM. Well, we're gonna, we're gonna start getting real benefit uh, immediately. But it feels like it's going to take five or 10 years to, to, to wrangle that software supply chain under some semblance of control. Um, when you do get your SBOM, you need to make sure that you are aware of all those vulnerabilities and you need to mitigate them. If you have control into the uh, development organization, you need to make sure someone's fixing them. Of course, your DevSecOps system or your air gap isn't going to fit, it is going to work against uh, a firmware vulnerability, right? In your PC, there's a simple one, you're allocating one block or one byte and reading up to 64 bytes into it. Um, and it can be, it can exist early enough in the boot process that it's not detectable by the standard tools that we've got. Final thing about DevSecOps. <clears throat> uh, there is no such thing as the DevSecOps pipeline. Everyone who writes software, tests software, knows that every target, every language requires a different set of tools. Yes, you can control the, the you can specify global requirements for your, your DevSecOps pipeline. Um, you can mandate the workflow through it, but you're going to need a lot more tools. You're going to need a larger attack, uh, attack surface in order to make DevSecOps work for a large organization. And keep in mind, somewhere on the right side of that is your security boundary. You need to have the staging in place and solid enough so that you're not pushing out too many vulnerabilities quickly. All right, I'm kind of short on solutions here. Um, while you're reading that and mulling it over, in my very humble opinion, we shouldn't wait till every software leader and every program manager in the DOD mandates that anyone with X, X years of experience takes a month off and goes and gets certified. As I said, I think there's a lot of quick hit, easy, easy training that we can get, and it's not complicated concepts. So, like, a, and, you know, again, make everyone read Sonsum and Schroeder, <laughs> you know, um, that only takes a couple hours. But, to help your program, uh, th these are, I think, uh, the, the, the main names in uh, software assurance. The Joint Federated Assurance Center has a brand new website. 
with a lot more resources than it used to have. They do both hardware and software assurance. Uh, last May, the Crow's office came and walked us through their system security engineering guidebook. Pretty big document, um, but it's very valuable. Um, NIST, of course, was here last month. They do some of the most foundational work in, in securing software and systems. And I want to call out the, the SWACOP, the Software Assurance Community to Practice from the DOD National Nuclear Security Agency and the NSA. They have quarterly meetings. It may be worth sending someone from your organization to those. That's where the best minds in software assurance get together and talk about and try to tackle the biggest, uh, the biggest problems. Can we get a copy of Crows? I looked for version 5, I think it is the newest version. I can only find the previous version. So that if someone has a link to that, that'd be useful. Uh, if you look into the work of uh, any of the people I've looked, I've listed there, uh, you'll find some really good work in pro software assurance. John Keane is the software angel of death because he has been critical of software in the past. I'd like him. Um, but he's working with the standards bodies to clarify the definition of security and quality. If you look into the definition of security, you are told it's an aspect of quality. If you look into the definition of quality, security is an aspect of it. So the standards bodies are working on, and I think recent standards have been published that uh, give you something more to chew on there. Uh, Nancy Mead used to be at the Software Engineering Institute. Carol Woody's still there. Um, I've had the great pleasure of, of having Carol Woody's time on a weekly basis. I've learned so much over the last six years. Um, the CERT division still exists, still provides software assurance, cybersecurity expertise to software organizations around the nation. Um, David Wheeler at the Linux Foundation has done some really terrific work. I talk about taking a month off. That's how long it took me to study and learn and take my exam for CSSLP. I understand CISSP may be a bit bigger. Um, as I note on the next slide, DAU is coming out with a certification of their own that uh, will be extremely valuable. Uh, it's going to be a fairly large footprint. Um, but David Wheeler has a Linux Foundation uh, secure coding, secure software development, three class course. I'll put the link in the chat. Only takes 18 hours and it covers some really useful topics that a programmer can use right now. So I would recommend it. You might want to give them a, uh, a spam email. Um, and of course, you can look into the private sector organizations that I've listed there. So yeah, I'm, we're eagerly awaiting the issuance of the software assurance certification from DAU. You can always turn to ISC squared for the heavy lift. <clears throat> Tell your programmers to start thinking about um, thinking like a hacker. Point them to the attack framework from MITRE. Point them to the defend main, uh, framework. Point them to CWE. Make them learn the, the top 25 it should only take an hour or two. But once they get started, they might say, oh, wow, this is really interesting. Um, there are some getting started uh, resources on uh, all of Miter's websites. The OWASP top 10 is actually a, a subset of the CW top 25, but it's for open web applications, security. Uh, open, the OWASP has some great free tools, uh, OWASP Zap. Uh, is very well regarded. I've never actually used it myself, not having done web development recently. Um, point them to all of the resources that are available. Uh, remember, I mentioned attack and defend. They should probably be on that slide. Get to DevSecOps. Make sure you're running at least two security scanning tools. Um, in general, the commercial ones will all meet, be pretty close to each other and in, in the, the things that they detect. You're going to get a lot of uh, results from those security scans because uh, some of them have different levels of false versus true positives. Um, and, and so you need to get good, get your programmers good at weeding through the, the fault, weeding out the false positives, not missing any of the true positives. Put them in your backlog, put them in your defect tracker and, and schedule them for fixing based on their severity. severity. 
how to tell programmers how to uh, what value what information is valuable and critical. Well, that's what your program protection people do. That's what your intelligence people do. We need to get that information down to the software teams to say guard this piece of information. Be careful with modifying that. If your software developers don't know what their data flow looks like, make them. Um, make them pay attention to security boundaries uh, or, other, or internal boundaries, boundaries of all kinds. You can collect your metrics and uh, I think I've blathered on enough about the 50 year old completely unregulated software supply chain. All right, I think that's my last slide. Any questions, Philip? Thank you. That was perfect. Um, the the chat has been uh, pretty active with people dropping links and uh, resources in there. So um, if you haven't monitored the chat, but we do have one question uh, to start it off um, from M says general question here. What happened in the United Healthcare hack? I know their third party billing system and its data got compromised in a ransomware attack. What could they have done better from a software? Okay, I have not dived into that one. <laughs> Sorry, um, it is it's not a not something that's affecting the DoD directly uh, or Sentinel. So, I'm sorry. Um, I have read an article or two about it. Uh, I don't know the de the technical details. I don't know if anyone does if it's been published. Sorry about that. Okay, no worries. Um, I did see a couple different questions about people asking for the slides. Um, they were posted to today's webinar amount announcement. Um, I, I put that link in the chat, but if you don't have the direct link, you can always go to csiac.org forward slash webinars and then find today's webinars. And then um, at the bottom, there will be the download link. Uh, please also check back to the CSIAC website um, in a couple of days where we will also have the recording of this webinar. Um, but we do have a couple minutes left. Um, please don't be shy if you have any more questions for Linda. Now is the time to ask. Uh, the next days. question that just came in from from Greg says, uh, "What is the current fix slash workaround to ransomware?" It's a loaded question. All of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. Um, no, it's, it's a really good question. And uh, if you find it, then you will be a billionaire. Um, let's see. Yeah, uh, ransomware, I mean, know what software you're running. If you don't know who wrote it, possibly rewrite it. <laughs> Uh, yeah. We do have uh, a general question from Teresa. Uh, she says, thank you for the enjoyable information. If we note you as the author, can we reuse some of your slides? I think so. Um, be aware that there's at least one error in it, the pie chart, and uh, the history is a little dated. I forgot the, the Yahoo reach on, on the history of the Black Hat side. Um, I think, you know, it, Produce them with taxpayer money, so probably. I'm not a lawyer. As far as I'm concerned, you can reuse them. Okay. Uh, the next question from Christopher. Do some industries have better uptake on improving their security posture than others? I am in a hard rock. I, I am in hard rock mining and no one seems to care. I'm sorry, Philip, could you repeat that question? Yes, no problem. From Christopher, he says, do some industries have better uptake on improving their security posture than others? I am in hard rock mining and no one seems to care. Ah, software's eating the world. It's eating most of the world. It's still, you know, working on the last 5% of it or so. Um, gosh, find a programmer and give him my pop quiz. I mean, I wish I had a better answer. Um, hard rock mining, is that considered critical infrastructure? You know, your safety people. Let's see. 
you've got software controlling something that can crush someone or crush their foot or fail to vent gases, that's a safety concern. And um, do you, there, there will be some teeth behind it. It's really, that's a big question about the, uh, the industry and the government regulation that's allowed there. So get with the safety people, talk about software and uh, identify, come up with a plausible scenario for how someone could get hurt or killed. I hope that helps. Thank you. Uh, next question from M uh, states, the speaker mentioned a 14 hour training cert certification. Yep, I put the link back in. I think it's 18 hours by their recommendation. Um, yeah, if you are a programmer, it will make perfect sense to you. Really well done. Um, and, and like I say, it, uh, it, now if you want your certificate, you're supposed to pay for that, but you can take the course without paying. There's three lessons. And, and that's the link that you dropped in the chat from the Linux Foundation, correct? Yes, training Linux Foundation. Yep, uh, Mr. Wiles put that in at 12.54, so just uh, use that link in the chat. Uh, the next question from Jeffrey, uh, why does DOD tend to prefer, prefer MIME over PGP? Prefer which to which? Uh, MIME, M-I-M-E over PGP. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> that's a cybersecurity question. Uh, that's a kind of a cyber policy question, uh, which is a well, I don't know if it's above my pay grade. Maybe it's a, maybe it's a programmatic thing. Yeah, I'm, I don't have expanding experience. Sorry, with MIME, I know PGP is pretty good privacy. I didn't know MIME was a privacy regime. Sorry. Worries and. That's that's about it. I'm monitoring the chat. I see um I, I see a lot of compliments. So we like to thank uh, Mr. Wallace for presenting today. Um, he worked hard behind the scenes, uh, making sure that we were able to to get here today, working with the slides and getting approvals and things like that. Um, I would recommend everybody to check back to the web to the website for the recording, which will be up uh, very shortly. Um, and the the slides are there now. Um, this month is rather unique for CSI. We actually have two presentations. We had to unfortunately cancel our December webinar. So we have one on generative AI uh, talking about um, open source software security and chat GPT and things like that in a couple of weeks. So hopefully we see you online for that as well. Um, but in the meantime, feel free to reach out directly to me or uh, the presenter if you have any other questions. Uh, and thank you for joining. Thank you, everyone.